Titanic's collision with an iceberg. Simple event at first glance. A ship traveling too fast through a known ice region encountered an iceberg. It was spotted too late and a turning maneuver attempted before the collision occurred, sealing the new ship's fate and causing the deaths of nearly 1,500 people. However, look closer and one begins to see inconsistencies and cracks in the generally accepted story and timeline of what happened when the Titanic met her iceberg. Some modern theories have attempted to alleviate these inconsistencies, saying Officer Murdoch spotted the berg at the same time Fleet did in the crow's nest. It completely overlooks the fact that Murdoch gave his order to change the course of the ship after the phone call took place, according to Robert Hitchens' testimony. It is a decent theory, but one that I have a particular problem with. Mainly that it relies almost entirely on Quartermaster Hitchens to be mistaken about the phone call. For those who do not know, here is the generally accepted timeline of Titanic's collision. Titanic was traveling at 22 and a half knots when lookout Frederick Fleet spotted an iceberg directly in the ship's path. He called down to the bridge where 6th Officer James Moody answered the phone. Fleet relayed the information to Moody, who in turn called out to 1st Officer William Murdoch. Murdoch responded by immediately ordering the helm to be put hard to starboard in an attempt to turn the ship to port and miss the berg. Ten seconds later, the helm's put hard over and the ship strikes the berg. Murdoch seals the watertight doors and orders the helm hard to port. In all, 37 seconds have passed from the time of the iceberg sighting to the initial contact. We can start to build up a timeline with the groundwork laid down by Edward Wilding, a naval architect for Harland and Wolf, in 1913 and 1915. He gave performance analysis and mathematical statements into the capabilities of Olympic and Titanic. Thanks to him, we know that in order for the ship to perform a two-point turn, or 22 and a half degrees, 37 seconds would pass by, and the ship would travel forward approximately 1,300 feet. Next, we can look at the testimony of Quartermaster Robert Hitchens, who was at the ship's wheel at the time of the collision. He testified that he had received no orders. Officer Moody answered the phone behind him and then hung up before turning to Murdoch to alert him of the lookout's warning. Murdoch acknowledged this and ordered the helm hard to starboard. It took him four complete turns of the wheel and about 10 seconds total to get the wheel hard over. Moody then reported to Murdoch that the wheel was hard over just as the ship was colliding with an iceberg. Nevertheless, the curious part of his testimony is that he said the ship had turned two points or 22 and a half degrees before the collision occurred. We know, thanks to Edward Wilding's mathematics and experiments on board Olympic after the accident, that to execute such a turn takes about 37 seconds. So there seems to be some time missing from Hitchens' recollection of the collision. Let us switch focus now to look out Frederick Fleet, the man who spotted the berg. His testimony indicates that he spotted the iceberg then instantly rang the bell three times, immediately after which he picked up the telephone to ring the bridge. He then interestingly claims that he was at the telephone for about half a minute before he hung up. He looked up from setting the telephone down to see that the ship had started turning and only just turned around two points before the ship hit the ice. Fleet also drew a diagram of what the iceberg looked like as he spotted it. Curiously, he puts it off the starboard bow and not directly in front of the ship as always established. With the timing of Fleet's testimony added into the equation, it can be deduced the ship struck the berg 
12 to 27 seconds after Hitchens finished the hard over maneuver and not instantly as claimed. Another survivor, quartermaster Alfred Oliver, also had some light to shed on the situation. He testified that he was on the compass platform atop the first class lounge roof on the boat deck when he heard the three bells ring. He started walking along the side of the boat deck towards the bridge, which at an average walking pace takes about 50 to 55 seconds to do. Upon arriving at the bridge, he saw the top of the iceberg glide past over Murdoch's shoulders with the first officer shouting hard a port. He then mentions that the iceberg was still alongside the ship very tightly until it reached the stern, at which point it began to move away because the ship was finally responding to the helm command. Now the timing of the collision is beginning to take shape. We have established Titanic speed and the timing and distance it takes her to perform a turn of 22 and a half degrees. Fleet has spotted the iceberg, rings the bell three times, and phones the bridge. Approximately 30 seconds later, he hangs up. At that same moment, Moody hangs up the phone on the bridge and turns to Officer Murdoch to say, Iceberg right ahead, sir. Murdoch immediately orders the helm to put hard to starboard. Hitchens begins to turn the ship's wheel hand over hand. Back in the crow's nest, Fleet hangs up the phone and looks up to see the ship already beginning to turn. On the bridge, it has taken 10 seconds for Hitchens to put the helm hard over, and Moody calls out this confirmation to Officer Murdoch. Approximately 27 seconds later, the ship has completed her two-point turn, but hits the iceberg in the end. Officer Murdoch steps to the warning switch for the watertight doors to close and signals them to close. Quartermaster Oliver rounds the corner of the boat deck to see the iceberg passing alongside the ship, and he hears Officer Murdoch command for the ship put hard to port. They all watch as the iceberg glides alongside the hull but not colliding anymore. It deposits chunks of ice in open portholes on E deck. It wets the Café Parisienne windows up on B deck until it reaches the stern and Titanic begins to drift away from the ice. From the time of the iceberg sighting to the collision, it was about 55 seconds and not the 37 seconds as previously established, all while agreeing with the survivor testimony of those on watch during the collision. Nevertheless, why did the lookouts and officers on board fail to see such a large object almost directly in Titanic's path until it was too late to react. Due to the height from the water, the lookouts typically had an unobstructed view for 10 to 12 miles while standing in the crow's nest. Likewise, Officer Murdoch should have been capable of 7 to 8 miles of sight from his vantage point on the bridge. However, as established in the video, due to Titanic's speed, Neither Murdoch nor the lookouts spotted the berg until it was approximately 2,500 feet from the ship, shy of half a mile. The answer may lie in the research done by Tim Malton, traveling the world and combing through logbooks of various steamers before, during, and after the Titanic accident occurred. He found that many of them reported refraction in the area of the disaster. Refraction, also known as a cold air mirage, is a deadly phenomenon for a ship to encounter on the open ocean. Hot air mirages are observed easily by driving on a highway. They are the wet-looking puddles one sees on the road that disappears before one reaches them. What is happening is that the atmosphere is interacting with light waves and bending the horizon downwards. A cold air mirage is precisely the opposite in that instead of bending the horizon downwards, it bends upwards. The upward characteristic has a drastic effect on what appears on the horizon to the lookouts on board Titanic. Small objects would be distorted, 
and appear much enlarged than usual. Furthermore, large objects, like a distant iceberg, would be almost hidden entirely from view. It means that on the night of April 14th, the lookouts and officers were peering out onto the horizon and seeing nothing out of the ordinary. They could not see the iceberg camouflaged within the mirage until the ship was nearly on top of it. Lookout Fleet even later recalled that he first noticed something akin to a haze on the horizon at around 11.30 p.m., 10 minutes before the collision. However, he could not make out what it was. He described it as an absence of stars. Here, for the first time, we can watch this all play out in real time. Everything added together, all accounts reconciled, and the lurking iceberg hidden by a rogue atmospheric phenomenon. <laughs>